Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Food Waste and Food Rescue What's It All About talk. I'm Stephanie Oslegel Jordan, and I'm the local food program manager here at Sustainable Solano. Um, it's great to have all of you guys with us today. We had almost 50 people registered, so after this is all said and done, we're going to send it back out to everybody. So thanks to all of you who are joining us here live on this Zoom. Um, if anyone is not familiar with Sustainable Solano, we are a nonprofit here in Solano County. Our mission is to nurture initiatives for the good of the whole, and we create programs that promote ecologically regenerative, economically, and socially just communities in a world that works for everyone. And we do that through four main initiatives. The first is green infrastructure, which includes community gardens, um, permaculture food forests, mostly on private properties, but sometimes on public properties. We do some urban forestry, and we also have a program called Resilient Neighborhoods, which does engage neighbors in a lot of those same concepts of creating shared solutions through permaculture gardens and recycled water. We have a youth leadership and workforce development program, which guides and inspires students to live within the uh, environmental capacity of one planet that we are on and also to help them develop a, an understanding of sustainability principles and equip them with practical skills to go out and make a difference in the world on their own. We have community conversations, which is talks, lectures, films, and the like, uh, kind of like this one today. We also uh, gather community members for a feedback loop so that we are providing programs that can help serve our communities in the best way. And then there is the local food program, which our talk today kind of falls under mostly, and the mission of our local food program is to create an econ sorry, economically viable, environmentally sustainable, and socially just local food system in Solano County. So we really are trying to um, connect all of the people that live here with our local farmers and local food in whatever form that, that takes. So um, I just wanted to show you guys a quick visual. We have a Solano Local Food System Alliance, which is composed of a variety of stakeholders in the county. And we have this graphic that we use a lot in those meetings. And it's also posted on our website. Um, so I just want to share it with all of you just to kind of show the complexity of a food system. So we have, it kind of looks like a hamburger, which is a little bit strange, <laughs> but here it is. We have our alliance at the top and then we have a lot of community awareness and support, um, you know, which is the general public. And then we kind of have these pillars. So, you know, there's food policy um, ordinances, let's say for urban gardening or urban agriculture. There's the whole batch of institutional customers, which is, you know, the hospitals, the schools, the, the consolidators, the, you know, retailers, on and on. Um, children and youth are also a part of this, and we're going to be starting a new youth cooking pilot program this year and hopefully expand it out where we're actually teaching kids some culinary skills and, also, and getting them to understand this larger food system and, and how they can play a part in it. Um, and then we have the direct-to-consumer area, which is a lot of the CSA, community-supported agriculture programs that the farmers have, farm stands, um, agritourism is a part of that. Um, there's not too many community kitchens yet, but hopefully there will be someday. And then, of course, we want to bring equity into all of these different areas, too. Um, at the bottom are the farmers. Uh, mostly we want to be supporting those who are diversified and working the land in environmental and sustainable ways and really keep their markets strong so that we can keep a lot of our land and agriculture and keep their work you know, economically viable for, for them. And then we're kind of this nonprofit here at the bottom holding this vision and helping to hold it all together. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you can visit sustainablesolano.org, uh, go to the local food page and you can check it out more and, and see all these you know, more definitions and feasibility studies, et cetera. So just to kind of give you guys a little context about where this is, you know, where uh, food waste and food rescue is falling. You know, it is part of this larger complex food system. And uh, as Heather will talk in a little bit, of, you know, the coronavirus kind of broke that system apart and really showed us what was not working. And so I have always kind of felt over the past year that, 
you know, here we are kind of at a pivotal point where we can help to rebuild the system in a better way so that it serves more people, it is more equitable, um, the farmers are getting, you know, more markets and we're really utilizing a lot of the food that might be in a backyard tree or that might be going to waste and, and get that cycled and circled back into the larger food system. So that's kind of what we're focusing on today is this idea of, you know, where does food get wasted? How can it be rescued? And who are the people on the ground helping to move that forward? So, um, as may, many of you might know, Americans are not so good at preventing food waste. Um, the average American household throws out about 25% of the food that they purchase, which translates into a family of four throwing out more than $1,600 a year uh, of wasted food, essentially. And this food waste problem does not serve our climate at all, especially when the food ends up in the landfill, which is, you know, for me in Venetia, it's my blue bin. Um, so the, some stakeholders higher up in, at the state level uh, and scientists have, you know, figured this out, <laughs> thankfully, and CalRecycle has passed some new laws which are coming into effect in a neighborhood near you real soon. And so I want to turn it over now to Marie Knutson, who is the recycling coordinator at Republic Services. And she's going to speak a little bit more about these laws and uh, specifically what we can expect to see in Benicia uh, and maybe even anywhere in the state for that matter and how they're going to affect us. So Marie, take it away. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, there are some important laws that are coming up. And my job as a recycling coordinator is to help businesses and help the residents keep as much out of the landfill as possible. And why that's really important is the landfills are going to be full in about 30 to 50 years. So that sounds far away, but the next generation is gonna to have to deal with this. And really who wants to waste good ground on building a new landfill? And it takes so many years to get one approved. On top of that, um, where are you going to put garbage after? You're going to bury, bury it in your own backyard or store it in Ziplocs in your closet? No. So we got to get to zero waste. And also part of the problem is we're fighting climate change. So when you take this wasted food that, that uh, Stephanie mentioned and you put it in a landfill, the organic matter breaking down it decomposes and it generates methane gas. And this greenhouse gas has a stronger effect, 86 times stronger than the carbon dioxide that our cars produce. So one of the things that we really have to do is get all of this food waste and yard waste out of the landfill. So how, who's gonna do that? Well, Stephanie mentioned CalRecycle. That is a state agency that is overseeing uh, diverting more from the landfill as well as uh, curbing greenhouse gases. So they came up with two laws. Uh, the first one is Assembly Bill 1826. Again, Assembly Bill 1826, if you ever wanna look it up on the CalRecycle website. And this business start, this um, bill started with looking at businesses that were larger and if they had a lot of food waste, they had to set up an organics account. And the organics account uh, collected all that food waste separately. So at first they started with large places like a, a grocery store or places like Valero that had a large amount of employees and they could set this up in their lunch rooms. For each year uh, or every couple years, the threshold was smaller. So more and more businesses fit in the threshold and had to have organic accounts. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to try and share a screen and show you what organics is. Let's see if I can get this to, there we go. So organics is any food waste or grain waste. That includes 
food, uh, meat, cheese, bones, coffee grounds, uh, and food soil paper. So like that pizza box that you can't recycle because it's all nasty on the bottom can go into composting. And all of that is collected in separate carts and then goes off to our composting facility in Richmond. And then twice a year, I bring it back as compost that is ready to go and you can use this in your gardens. So that's one way we're working with Assembly Bill 1826 is we do have composting going for businesses. Now, depending on where you live, you may already have it for your home, which is great. Um, right now in Benicia, we only have it in like the restaurants again in the larger facilities. So let's say you go out to dinner at Bella Siena or uh, Sailor Jack's or one of the places around in Benicia. When they take your plate back, they are already scraping the plate into a special container and getting it to the carts curbside. So now with the next bill that's coming out, um, that one is State Bill 1383. And I'm gonna unshare my screen. Uh, that bill is uh, different. It's focused on the big businesses. Again, it's requiring large businesses like grocery stores and uh, places that sell any kind of food, they have to donate it. So the point is it should be people first, animal second, composting third. So what the places like say Safeway or um, any of the other grocery stores are gonna have to do, even like the Rite Aids that have food, is they have to keep logs and they're gonna have to prove to CalRecycle that they're not throwing any food away, that it is either being donated and where it's being donated and cradle the human, <laughs> um, or if, they're, if it's expired, what are they doing with it? Uh, is it still good enough for animals or are they gonna put it in compost? And are they composting it through Republic Services or are they um, doing it through their own facility? Um, so in Benicia, what's happening is we're gonna start having that for your home. So in your green waste cart, you'll be able to put all foods, not just unprocessed fruits and vegetables. So what's great with that is that's coming soon uh, in definitely by Sometime in 2022, the council, city council is already working on it. And your yard waste cart will be able to accept that same uh, food that I showed you in that poster. It will go to composting, come back to you is great compost. Uh, your yard waste will be collected weekly instead of biweekly. So there's some wonderful things happening. And again, that's a great way to keep all of this out of the landfill so that it's not creating the methane gas, the greenhouse gases that are affecting our climate. So I'll be around at the end if you have any questions and I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you, Marie. Uh, yeah, just a quick note for those of you that just joined us. Um, we will be doing a, a little Q&A. Sorry, my lighting is, I got lots of sun coming in right now. Uh, we'll be doing kind of an audience Q&A toward the end, um, probably in about, you know, around 6.45 or so. So if you do have questions, um, I'm happy to unmute you or you can just type your questions in the chat and then I will read them back to people. Um, so that kind of gives all of you guys a little, not a little, big <laughs> overview, you know, and the bigger picture of what's going on out there in the world. And I want to transition now from kind of this larger picture of these laws to what's going on on the ground. Um, I'm going to introduce Heather Perini next. Uh, Heather is actually one of Sustainable Solano's food forest keepers. She was one of the first here in Venetia. And 
she had an amazing backyard permaculture food forest garden. And at maturity, these gardens create hundreds of pounds of food. I don't know, Nicole, if you're on, could you chime in with about how many pounds a food forest would produce just for fun? If not, no worries. Let's see if she's out there. I'm here. You are here. Yeah, can you see me? Yeah, I don't yeah, have coloring, coloring here. That's um, okay. It's like, I was just pulled it up because I know you were asking me about it and I believe it's like five, at maturity. So like at five years, um, they produce 500 pounds of food annually by its fifth year. By its fifth year, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So basically the bottom line is that Heather is going to have a lot of food. And so she did have a lot of food and she started to put it out for the community. And what happened next is the beginning of <laughs> a big part of Heather's life. So go with it, Heather. <laughs> Tell us what happened next. <laughs> I know. What did I do with that? Um, <laughs> this is a uh... This is one of those things that I think happens once in a lifetime. Um, so I'm Heather Perini. I run Food is Free Solano, Solano Gleaning Initiative, and the Parkit Market. So these are all things I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, as Stephanie had said, I joined in with Sustainable Solano in the Backyard Food Forest Program. It's six years ago now, I think, uh, was when my garden was planted. And... Um, I always give away the excess and I always make sure that we had a little table in our front yard where the extra tomatoes or kale or something like that could uh, could be picked up by our neighbors or people walking by. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I had my little table up there and I think there was probably chard on there. I have a chard that will never die. Um, so I was noticing that people were looking under the baskets. People were looking for food. And if this was what was happening in Benicia in March of 2020, within weeks of the pandemic. What was happening elsewhere? What was happening in our world? And what can we do about it? Uh, and so I decided I was going to do something about it. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show you guys a little presentation I put together. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Ta-da! Share screen. There we go. Um, okay, yep. so Food is Free Solano started just in my front yard. Uh, this is what it looked like at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I had this cute little chalkboard that we put together. Um, my daughter would help me load it up with the produce from our garden, and sometimes our neighbors would put things on there. Um, after I noticed so many more people in need, I decided, okay, we're going to do pop-up food stands throughout Venetia. They need to be mobile, autonomous. They need to connect the neighborhood and eliminate barriers. So this uh, adorable little drawing was my thought process of what am I going to do? How am I going to make this happen? And within a few weeks, we had a dozen food stands. We had a bunch in Venetia and we decided, huh, okay, well, we need to expand. Things got real and they got big and it happened very quickly. So within, uh, I think it was within three months of starting the food stands throughout Benicia, um, I decided we need to go countywide. We need to find more food for everyone that we can. And I started looking for sources of food and I found the USDA Farmers to Families Food Bank or Food Box Program. And so these, uh, these pictures you're seeing right now are uh, of our first distribution, Milkapalooza, and the mm -hmm. coordinating distributions between the food bank and then Food is Free Solano. We brought in trucks of food. Uh, the USDA program uh, put together these boxes of food for families that were from farmers that would have been impacted by coronavirus. It kept the food processors in business, kept the packers in business, kept the farmers in business. And it was a huge program. Each truck has between 22 and 24 pallets of food on it. Each pallet of food has between... Um, I think there were between 40 and 65 boxes, depending on size. And so each truckload of foods around 40,000 pounds. Uh, so we brought in um, 
trucks of food. And we figured out how to do it. We brought it, we created this amazing network of volunteers. We reached out to organizations that already do the work in our community. This picture right here you'll see is Benjamin Bugs with Faith Food Fridays, who allowed me to use his back lot for a few weeks until we could figure out a space. Uh, this is one of our volunteers. Once we figured out space at the Solano County Fairgrounds in Vallejo, we were able to utilize a forklift and um, put together a 40-foot reefer and a 20-foot reefer plus storage space where we could unload the food, keep it food safe at, uh, at the right temperature until we could have distribution happen and get that food out to families. Um, not all of it went well. Sometimes pallets would fall over in the truck and we would unload them by hand. Sometimes the forklift would get stuck and we would have to get big equipment out there to move the pallets. Um, so it never went easy, but it was always exciting. And it was always um, an amazing time with our community because the people who were there were willing to do this work. Uh, that's my husband, Frank, who has supported me throughout all of this. He's kind of a unicorn, as my friends will say. Um, and that's at our site at the fairgrounds. Um, so we brought in 3.3 million pounds of USDA Farmers to Families food boxes for the county. And those were distributed via uh, a network we created of community groups including mutual aid groups. You didn't have to be a nonprofit. You didn't have to exist before the pandemic. This is all about uh, getting food to the people who fall through the cracks, to the people who were newly, uh, newly food insecure, to the people who were navigating this space for the first time. Uh, for the people who didn't have transportation or were immune compromised and all of those sorts of things that couldn't go out and, um, and get to a food bank or Faith Food Fridays or one of the places throughout the county that provide food for our people in need. And it worked really well. We, uh, I, I, I can't even imagine um, what we would have done without the great volunteer network and the network of, of groups that we kind of connected with. It was, it was truly extraordinary. So the USDA program ended in May. So May 31st, May 28th was our last truck. And, um, and we had to look at, well, what are we going to do now? We have created this network. We have connected these people, these volunteers. And we decided that we want to continue as Food is Free Solano with our neighborhood food stands with a gleaning program. So go, gleaning is going out and picking excess fruit or produce from neighborhood trees, from uh, kind of anywhere that it's available. So uh, our little flyer, Got, got Fruit, Want Help Picking? <laughs> Do you wanna share? And, um, and we, we go and we send volunteers out to pick this food. Uh, Kimber with the Rotary Club has been doing that for a couple of years now, and they bring it, drop it directly at the food bank of Solano and Contra Costa. Um, but we created this as uh, kind of an adjunct to the food stand so that what I was doing at the beginning of the pandemic and last year and the year before, where we would just share our excess became more normalized and uh, in, in a certain way more formalized by sending the volunteers out and having this distribution network. Um, so Solano Gleaning Initiative is a project of Food is Free Solano. Um, we have, uh, I probably need to hide the thumbnails. <laughs> uh, we have a, uh, a cute little flyer that some of our volunteers drop buy houses that say when life gives you lemons or plums or oranges or persimmons, call us to help pick your tree. And this has been really successful. So our gleaners um, <laughs> have brought in thousands and thousands of pounds of fruit within the last few months. Stone fruit season is upon us. And uh, our refrigerator unit in uh, at the fairgrounds is full right now. It is full of plums and cherries and peaches, and I'm not even really, I think apricots as well. So uh, we have some really great volunteers who, who go and pick, and then we have volunteers who come, uh, package them up into mesh bags, and then we distribute them out to the same network of people that have been picking up USDA boxes. So 
part of what we're doing along with the gleaning is um, food rescue. So what is food rescue? So we talked a little bit about how, um, how restaurants are going to be getting their food into compost and that sort of thing. Well, what about uh, if they have food that's not been processed or cooked yet, but it needs to get out before they can process or cook it. That's what a food rescue organization will kind of come into play. That's when that organization will come into play. And we send volunteers out throughout the county now, and they pick up <laughs> food that is left over. Right now, we are uh, kind of piloting this program with the uh, school districts. So we have Vacaville today. This was our first pickup from Vacaville Unified School District. We organized um, one volunteer to go pick up. We thought that it might fit within one car, but Carmen said that uh, her car, all of the nooks and crannies were filled. And look at this beautiful food. I mean, this is an amazing bounty wow. that we're able to bring to folks. And so our food rescues typically fit inside one car, but Tetra skills are always required. Uh, this is from the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District. And so these are school lunches that are already prepackaged in a bag. And those bags are very easy to hand out at distributions. They're easy for groups that feed the unhoused to be able to take those bags and then hand them directly to an unhoused person. The foods don't require cooking. Um, and so it's, it's a way of minimizing the waste that might happen due to the nature of school food programs right now. School food programs are uh, making food ahead of time for families to pick up, but there's always families who can't come pick up or there is, um, there's a chance that you might buy too much of one thing and have some excess. And our organization will, um, will step in and help distribute that. So we'll pick it up and then we're going to start distributing this food. So we distribute through our organization of groups that we've connected with already, but we're also doing what we're calling the park it market. So the park it market's a mobile farmer's market that gets deployed to childcare centers. Um, why childcare centers? Because uh, people who are really impacted by COVID, people who have been, who have uh, needed to be working through this entire time, they're still bringing their kids to child care. And the child care centers um, at pickup time, it's a perfect opportunity for us to bring this adorable trailer with some adorable kids who won't be in the trailer, but the trailer would be filled with boxes of produce. So fruits and veggies, maybe some canned goods or other supplies if we have something available. We bring it to the child care site. We set it up. We have little displays where the produce is uh, set, set up just like a farmer's market. And then we leave and the child care center is able to present this to their families and have their families go through and shop. And shopping for this produce that has been uh, gleaned from our local neighborhoods that has been purchased from our local farms, uh, just as if they were going shopping at a farmer's market. Uh, it provides this, this dignity to the families. It provides excellent nutrition. It provides choice. Um, and so this is all things that uh, Food is Free Solano really, it, it really supports our basic principles that food is, is a human right. And uh, access and equity in food is one of the most important pieces of what we can work on. Um, and so the Parkit Market is launching this month. Uh, we received a grant from No Kid Hungry to pilot the program within Vallejo. So I am collecting Vallejo Child Care Center's information, people who might be interested in hosting. And we will be scheduling our first Parkit Market very soon. Uh, and then we are looking at, uh, we've been a We've been recommended for funding from First Five Solano, and once th those contracts are written, we'll be able to expand this program further throughout Solano County. So thank you for spending the evening with us. Um, my website is right there, foodisfreesolano.org. So you can always go and check that out. Um, I'm, very, uh, I'm very excited being able to uh, share this with you guys. Uh, so I'm gonna stop the sharing now so I can, get a little, uh, <laughs> um, and I check my notes real quick. So we are always looking for volunteers. 
um, for the gleaning initiative. I know Kimber's group, the Rotary Club in Fairfield and Sassoon, they do a lot of gleaning as well. And I know they, uh, so we're always looking for volunteers for that. Um, we're looking at food sorting and packaging volunteers. So on some afternoons, we set up on our website a sign-up sheet where people can sign up to come in for a couple hours. We sort the, fr the produce that came in, we bag it up so it can be sent out fairly easily. And um, so one thing that we're, we're doing now that is uh, really exciting, so shifting from the huge volume distribution of the USDA boxes to this new program, basically, where we're gleaning food and we're purchasing local food and we're uh, we're filling in the gaps locally. Uh, we, are able, we are shifting at the fairgrounds to have access to a commercial kitchen. So we're, we're very excited about that and what opportunities it might give us for the future and other organizations that we partner with. So um, back to you, Stephanie. Okay. All right. Thank you, Heather. Um, there's a couple questions here. Uh, the first one I'm going to direct to Marie, and it's someone from Florida. And so Let's see here. Yeah, L Liza, I think maybe if I have her name right, um, she says, is the composting program going to be piloting soon? And so I'm not sure if she's asking about Florida is, or just, I mean, we're talking specifically here about California. These, the AB, the assembly bill and the state bill that Marie was talking about are specific to California. Um, but Marie, do you know of anything going on in other states? And well, um, uh, California definitely is leading the charge on a lot of this, uh, on, but also in, on the East Coast as well, some of the bigger cities. And of course, uh, um, all through California, this is happening with those laws. And it's kind of like seatbelts or recycling. Once it starts, it'll keep rolling and it'll keep going. And we'll get used to it and it'll be a normal. So it'll, if it's not in Florida yet, it will be coming your way. And even the large uh, venues like the casinos and that in Las Vegas, I know that they're doing a lot of that too because it makes sense. It's cheaper actually for them to be composting or donating food than putting it in a landfill and, and I think uh, we're becoming more and more agreement on climate change. So that our council members are listening more. <laughs> right. Thanks. Yeah. And I, if I remember correctly, the SB 1383, I think is going to require large mm -hmm. retailers and large restaurants and, you know, venues like those casinos to actually have uh, a partnership and an agreement and a or a contract with a food rescue organization. And so this is where Food is Free Solano is going to step in and kind of help fill the gap. Um, and I'm gonna kind of then bounce over to your question, Marie, which was to Heather, how do you get the word out to people to come and get food from you? And so this might be a good time, Heather, for us to talk about a couple of grants that we've written. Um, Sustainable Solano and Food is Free Solano have submitted a couple of grants. The first one, ironically, from CalRecycle, we did not get, but we <laughs> tried again with uh, the EPA, and it's it's an environmental justice collaborative problem solving grant. That's very wordy. Um, but it basically, what we want to do is coordinate a more robust very hyper local food rescue operation where let's say I'm a restaurant in Benicia and I have I've just catered something and I have you know three pans of lasagna that did not get used I can then go to a handy little mobile app which would be developed by a partner a very bright woman named Kim out of UC Davis um, I could go to this app and say who I am and what I have and the parameters for pickup, like must be picked up in an hour and a half or whatever. And then that would go out to whoever has subscribed for my particular geographic area or type of food or whatever. And then they can claim it and come and get it. So we are working and hopefully getting funding for a better streamlined system that would 
really get the word out to people in immediate areas um, who could then get that food, whether it's prepared food, you know, rescued food from a, a tree via gleaning or, you know, whatever the case is. And, you know, we're hoping retailers too would take advantage of this as well. Um, Heather, you want to add anything on to that? Did I describe it correctly? <laughs> So the, the food rescue app would, um, would be like being able to post on Facebook Marketplace or one of the Facebook groups where uh, you have something available and those that are looking for that something are able to, to claim it. And uh, one thing to kind of note is that many unhoused folks and people who are uh, at risk of becoming unhoused have cell phones. Cell phones are a lifeline in America right now, in the world right now. There are more people who have cell phones than bathrooms in our world. And using the, using the tools that we have now to be able to access the people who might not have access otherwise that um, aren't gonna be close to, trans, uh, to transit, aren't gonna have a vehicle, that sort of thing is, is really important. And it, it limits miles. It also limits miles traveled. So you're reducing air pollution. So all of these pieces stack on top of each other and they fit in very nicely in, uh, in a whole program, in a system that will work together sustainably and equitably long term. Um, so another way of answering your question of how does someone know, how do we offer, get the word out to people that food is available? Um, so I'm not doing public distributions from the fairgrounds right now, but we do have our neighborhood food stands where the stand keepers, so those are the volunteers who kind of uh, caretake that stand, they keep it clean, they stock it with food, they come and they pick up food from us to stock their stands. Um, and it goes out to other organizations like Vallejo Together or uh, Vallejo Peace Project or Solano Unity Network, all of these different smaller groups that then disperse it to their communities. Um, so if we do do a public distribution, there'll usually be some marketing on our website and on our Facebook page. Um, we've done quite a few of those with the USDA program. So if we have a large quantity available of something, we'll be doing more marketing and direct distributions. Um, and then the next question from Nicole, uh, what is the best way for someone that has extra produce to donate to Food is Free Solano? Uh, you can pick it and drop it off at any of the free food stands. We have a map on our website. You can uh, message us through our website. There's a gleaning page I posted in the chat and there's a form to fill out that says, hey, please come pick my tree. <laughs> I, I was struggling for a title that day. And, um, and you input your information and we'll get back to you with when we have availability. You can always email us through the website, through our Facebook page, Instagram. Uh, we try and, and have all of that available. And Carrie's got a question for Marie. Oh yeah. And you know, there's someone else here. Uh, I'm gonna unmute. Is it Lee or Lot? I think, okay. Oh, hi. Um, can people hear me now? Mm -hmm. you, okay, all right. So my question is for Marie. And I know that long time ago, Marie and I actually had a conversation about, um, you know, how San Francisco has a different program for their compost where you can dump food waste into the green bin. So I understand from what Marie said that they're starting that probably in 2022. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you know, one of the things Marie had told me was that one of the problems was because of meat. So if I were only to put in a greasy pizza box or a, you know, a, a corn cob that, you know, would that be able to be okay in the bin now? Or even things like bread, pasta, you know, as long as there's no meat product in it. Um, well, it's, it's not just the total meat when they, Right now, your your green waste, um, they look at it as yard waste, and they're doing it bi-weekly. So the pizza box right now would be hard because the driver might think that your yard waste is contaminated since they haven't 
the program isn't announced out there yet. And it's, it's uh, going to a little bit different place. Uh, the corn cob is fine though. That's pretty okay. much unprocessed fruits or vegetables. But the, again, the city of Benicia is working on the, the program and that, and they'll be bringing it to city council. So hopefully in, geez, 2022 is only six months away. <laughs> so right. in 2022, they have to have a program in place. And then sometime during 2022, it has to be initiated. Okay. But they've got to get your yard waste picked up weekly, or it would be kind of nasty sitting out in the heat for two weeks. Right. Okay. And so what about, um, do we know when that's going to the city council? So that we can make our voices known. Um, I would say I believe it's it's hitting around September, so that okay. it can it be so it can be uh, signed off by the end of the year. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Bonnie Hamilton. I just asked you to unmute. Hopefully that worked. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. And um, first of all, Heather, thank you for all you the work you've done over the last year. It's just amazing. And Marie, my question. I have a couple of questions for you. I am in Fairfield, and we can already do um, food and uh, uh, some paper and so forth in our green recycling. Um, I'm not sure if it's composted. I don't believe it is, but maybe you can clarify that. Um, but I also wanted to ask about things like paper towels, tea bags that don't have plastic, because I know that Lipton tea bags actually have plastic in them but other ones that like the ones I use don't. Um, mm -hmm. Coffee filters, bioplastic and greenware, um, are those okay in that green recycling? Um, Solano County is probably ahead of Benicia with getting that set up. So you're pretty safe with all food and food waste. A lot of times, Things like a tea bag, that little tiny bit of plastic is going to be so minute and the acidity of the composting is probably going to break it down so you're okay. I'm glad you brought up the part about the single-use utensils. The ones that say um, that they're compostable and biodegradable, they're not. There is no such thing as a single-use plastic um, uh, utensil that can break down in a composting facility. It, it breaks down in the landfill faster. So that was all of those wonderful companies marketed that as being more sustainable and wonderful and ecological and all they are is more expensive. <laughs> So unfortunately, the silverware in that still needs to go in the trash unless it's bamboo. And I would say reuse or bring your own metal yes. fork. Um, but yes. the other question I had is what happens, how, how, what happens if the truck is going around, someone is throwing something in it that is not green recyclable into their green recycling what happens? We had a conversation with um, someone else from, I think it was Ricola, who said that one little thing in that truck ruins the whole load. What is the situation uh, with Republic Service? Um, it can. Uh, if it was recycling, at least that's going in a conveyor belt and through sorting machines. Composting is not. And one of the things that's the hardest is when people put glass in there. Uh, so they have sorting machines that, or excuse me, like a sifter, kind of like if you were panning for gold and, and they turn it, so they try and capture it, but it's such a huge volume. It, it, yes, it, it can ruin a whole load if somebody put their, uh, you know, spray paint or something thinking that your green waste can is, is a garbage can. 
Yeah, she essentially said that just one like plastic bottle in there would ruin the whole load. Was con the whole load would be considered non-usable, which was really really sad. Um, hopefully that that wouldn't ruin the whole load. They capture what they can, but I think it depends on what they're putting in there too. Um, yeah. A lot of times in the compost, even that I'm able to bring back to everyone, it might have a little bit. Sometimes you'll find little bits of plastic, and that's probably because a restaurant gathered their food waste in a plastic bag instead of a compostable or biodegradable bag and put it in the compost and it didn't get caught. Well, and that brings up another thing. So I have seen those green, uh, it, they say they're compostable plastic bags and they're green colored. Are those actually truly compo compostable? Yes. Most okay. of them are. And then that, so that's what the restaurants are instructed to do to get biodegradable, 100% compostable bags. And that way they can keep their food contained and they, they like them because they can tie them off and it keeps their enclosure cleaner. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks for the questions. Uh, is anybody else? I'm kind of scanning the, uh, the list here. If you want to raise your hand, you can ask directly or feel free to put something in the chat. Terry Fisher from chat has a question. Yes. So Carrie says, I love compost, but it sometimes has plastic in it. We may have to pick out, or we have to pick out tiny pieces. Any tips on how to get pieces out? Uh, kind of related to what we were just talking about. <laughs> yeah. There we go, I had to unmute. Um, so it's a tough one. Uh, you can sift it a little yourself. Another way is if you're not using the, the compost as it is, you can always put it in a paint sieve or a pair of old nylons um, and make compost tea in your watering can. So that's one way if, if you feel like there's anything in there that, that you, uh, uh, you want to get out. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a way to get that out. Sometimes it just, it happens because people aren't paying attention and hopefully with education and uh, working together and we'll actually be auditing uh, green waste cans randomly uh, with that bill 1383 to make sure that people are doing a better job and paying attention. And uh, at some point there'll be fines for people that that are causing the contamination. Okay, thank you. Um, Marie, I have just one other compost question. So all of this green waste, you know, goes to eventually a composting facility. I mean, ideally we're getting it to the people first and then the animals and then the composting, but let's say the composting happens, then is there a way for the general public to access some of that compost? Like where does it go from there? Or does it go to a business who then sells us the compost? It goes to our Richmond facility. Uh, that's at One Par Boulevard. It's Golden Bear Transfer Station. You can pick it up. Uh, you would have to transport it yourself. It is by a uh, truckload. And it's, they, they do charge, but it's only about 20 bucks for a whole truckload. The, the giveaways that I do are twice a year. I do them in March for your spring garden and in August. And if you didn't receive the sustainable Venetian, I'm look at my, looking at mine on the wall. Um, the giveaway is August 7th. So Saturday, August 7th from nine to one, and that will be in the East E Street parking lot, the, the one that's off of First Street, or you can approach it across from the Yacht Club on East Second Street. So I'll, um, I, I think I can put that in the chat. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, and we'll be Should sure we to- 
I yeah. just had I just had a quick follow up to mm -hmm. my question um, about uh, same thing about paper towels. Are, are are paper towels okay if they're just food, not for cleaning, but just uh, dirty paper towels that have been used for food and so forth? If you're gonna my, I'm unmuted, okay. If you're gonna put them in your green waste now, if there's not a lot of them, and I would probably wet them so that they aren't as fluffy, because again, I don't want a driver to not take your green waste cart because he thinks it's contaminated. But they will be part of what's collected when the full food waste program is set up. Okay. Um, Kimber has a question. Do you need to be a Benicia resident to get the free compost or just a Solano County resident? It's, uh, it's basically for Benicia residents. If you come to my compost giveaway and you tell me you heard about it on this class, then I'll let you through. <laughs> How oh, nice of you, Marie. That's great. <laughs> I think the other trash management places have compost giveaways too, don't they? I think Maybe Fairfield and, too, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Any other questions out there? Looking again, just to make sure nobody has their hand raised. Okay, perhaps not. Uh, so once again, Heather is always looking for volunteers. Please visit Food is Free Solano, is it dot org? Uh, it was in the chat. I know you put it in the chat. So please check out her website if you have time to volunteer and stay tuned on sustainablesolano.org if we get this funding from EPA. <laughs> We will be spreading the word and looking to connect with a lot of community organizations to create uh, those networks and further build on the networks that Heather has already started, um, just to kind of get you know more resiliency and and more you know it's really just doing more communication and more connection between residents and organizations so that those people who are falling through the cracks, as Heather mentioned earlier can have access to healthy, uh, healthy food. Um, all right, good, thank you. There's a couple more things in the chat that were posted about the compost giveaway. So thank you, Marie. So, all right, uh, and lots of thanks. All right, good. So yes, environmental circular economy was mentioned there in the chat. That's, that's exactly right. It, we're just trying to keep it all very local and within the communities itself, so. Thank you so much, Heather, and thank you so much, Marie, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you guys at another presentation. So, thanks everyone Take for care. joining us. Thank you all. Thank you.